John, you're good? Join us today for Master Coaches Wednesday Weekly Buzz and our after show Buzz Reaction. I'm Ruth Nelson, joined by Hall of Famers Mick Haley, Bob Tucci, and Brian Gimolero, bringing you the most current issues and trends in volleyball. Our weekly news show has leaders in our sport provide their perspective on the questions that are asked, along with the discussions on topics that are current and ones that are affecting all of us. Want to make a difference? Please remember to renew your AVCA membership. This one organization that represents all coaches at all levels when lobbying for the changes that are needed in our sport. You can make a difference by registering at avca.org. Today's topics are rules, trends, and fads. And the questions we don't discuss, we will cover in the buzz reaction. As all of our viewers know, it is extremely difficult to have a three minute warning for our master coaches as they do have so much to share. So let's get started in the rules of the games are as follows. A rule trend or fad will be put up on the screen and all three of our master coaches has one minute to respond and or may give his time to another master coach to discuss. The game will start with a whistle. John? We didn't hear it. <laughs> okay. And we will provide you a one minute warning and a two minute warning. And when three minutes are up, you will receive your final whistle. John? Yeah, can we talk about those dumb okay. electronic whistles? We, yeah, okay. what is that? No, with no, whistles? hey, we then, we then show time out. We then show the next rule, trend, or fad. It's not your time to talk yet. We're still discussing. <laughs> Master coaches are ready to discuss the topics, as you can see, but we're not aware of all the rules until a few minutes ago. So for our viewers, let's see what the rules are of the game. All right, rule one. Let me get that up there so we can all see that. So, so our master coaches, especially. Rule one, <laughs> three minutes for each topic. Rule two, referee whistles and begins a topic. Rule three, one minute and two minute warnings. Rule four, you may use your minute or pass it on. And five, referee whistle ends the three minutes. All right, now let's hear the rest. However, Next week, we will have some guests that will be enlightening us on what the rules interpretations really are. So let's have some fun with master coaches. Mick, Brian, and Bob, are you ready? This is as bad as the challenge rule. There's too much, it takes too much time. Okay, remember, <laughs> we do not decide who goes first. It is teamwork among the three of you. John, let the games begin. Challenge one. Item one, challenges. All right, Nick, you've already started to address the challenges. Hey, right. how, how long it takes. With that. You go. All right. Well, I mean, they take an incredibly long time, all right, for the challenges. I, I think we have to find a way to streamline it. All right. One of the ways, of course, would be just having another official at the camera and let that official make the decision if it goes to a challenge. We only have bad examples in sports for challenges. Uh, in football, they put their head under a canopy, which looks and takes a long time and is ridiculous. It, it looks like they don't want to do it. Every umpire in Major League Baseball has to go and look at, uh, listen to somebody tell them the answer. That's can be done really quickly in the sports that have many cameras. But maybe volleyball can get ahead of it by finding a way to use the technology we have quickly, efficiently, and let's be ahead of these other sports. Well, one, the, minute. one minute. The excuse, one minute. The excuse has always been that we don't have a good enough uh, 
uh, video to to get it back fast enough. My, I don't want to talk about that on the challenges. I want to talk about why the officials can't run across the floor and run back to their position, why they have to walk and saunder over to the thing, walk over, then they got to talk to three more people and have a discussion, then they got to come back. And then at the end of the challenge, they make a decision. And then you know what happens? There's another 30 seconds to a minute and a half discussing why they made that with the coach that didn't win. So I, I think the challenges really need to be looked at. There are a lot of parts of it uh, besides just looking at the camera. Well, we have, we have extra time. How about yeah. that, Luke? What do you think about challenges? I challenge you. <laughs> Well, I think they're being used as timeouts. I, I don't think there should be, I don't think there should be three. Two minutes. The, the real I think that we need to, in volleyball, uh, challenges need to, you need to get your challenge back if, you're, if you win it. You, you shouldn't have to lose your challenge or know that it should be challenged, but you want to save your challenge until the end. I think we have to re look at it and then say, so many challenges, whatever, how many everybody should get, and then uh, get it back if you are successful. And, you, and you have to make a specific challenge. It can't be just they're going to review the whole rally and then pick out something. Oh, no, Bob, something. I like any long rally a challenge because you'll find something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's some uh, new ideas in the challenges coming forward. Uh, there's one proposal that we'll find out next week because we have referees coming on next week, um, but we can ask them point blank. Uh, the the new ch there are two things. Ch All right, next one. Okay, <laughs> item two: screening. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about screening for a just little bit. Just screened. This is, okay. <laughs> this is my pet peeve on on this. They should just get rid of this rule. This is this is a silly rule because the way they're interpreting it makes no sense at all. All right. It's not happening so much in the women's game, but the men's game, it's happening all the time. I mean, the five players will set up all right, what constitutes in normal when the, the rule first came out, a normal screen. All right. Their interpretation that as long as you can see contact of the ball, there is no screen. Well, everybody's jump serving. So immediately the officials say that the person's above the screen so you can see them. That's not always the case, but the, the, the players still continue to set up that screen. Well, they wouldn't do it if there wasn't anything of value happening prior to the contact. The approach angle the guy is coming on, all right, the toss of the ball. All right, I mean, there's a lot that happens prior to the contact, the, the speed of the arm. One minute. One something. minute. Okay, next I, person. The thing, the thing I love about screening is this. <laughs> I, I think it's a, a good thing. I, I like to have it out there. But you know what happens? You, you set up your screen, you move it over, the server goes back, and she never serves over the screen. She always serves the left or right. <laughs> of the and it is the funniest thing I watched all fall in this spring. There was not one time that I saw somebody serve over the top of an actual screen. They served around it or did different places, and, and the screens moved all over. So it was pretty funny from my standpoint. They, I, I just think that, uh, you know, everybody could assume a normal position. And if they're not in a normal position, getting ready to block or play defense, it should, you know, you can't, you can't do that. Don't, you don't play with the game. I don't like it. The only place there should be a screen is around the court. So I don't get hit with the ball, you know, so that's <laughs> two minutes, <laughs> two minutes. Well, you know, I just, I, mean, I just Brian, think they, they either cool. gotta, they either have to allow the screen and say there is no rule against screening, no. or they need to change the interpretation of the rule because what the interpretation is now, as long as you make contact, I mean, I just think that's that, that's that's basically your screening. It, it, no it's, rule. Then can we go piggyback on uh, no rule? Can you go piggyback on yeah. the guys as long as you don't overlap? Is that it? So you know, that's what's going to gonna happen next because we haven't had a rule for that yet. I was told <laughs> the re reason they're screening, they're not really screening. They're trying to protect the back of their head when the server hits them in the back yeah, of the head. Yeah, yeah. Maybe well, so. that's true, too. That's but, protection. But they're covering up about a third of the court, and it does affect your ability to receive. 
Right. They, it, it should be. Uh, it should. They should outlaw it, in my opinion. They got. Well, I don't care if they outlaw you, it or they don't outlaw it. I, yeah. I'm okay with it. It's just that don't have a rule. Okay, here we follow. go. Uh, item three, power tips. All right. Really? That's another great one. We're going back to 1967, 68, and 69. John Stanley and John Alstrom came back from uh, the world championships in men's volleyball. And the only thing, and they're both the tallest players in the game at that time at six, eight and six, nine or six, seven and six, eight. And they started throwing the ball around the, the problem with this throwing the ball. And I'm, I'm talking about li literally slam dunking the ball. Uh, the problem with that is two things. We didn't want that at that time because we were trying to convince everybody to play the game with skill. And secondly, it takes a whole different defensive philosophy to handle a thrown ball as opposed to a hit ball or a tipped ball. And so you have to change how you teach. Now, maybe over time, if we wanted to do this, we could, we could teach techniques differently so we could get those. But uh, Brian always says in defense, you've got to be moving anyway. And so- um, One minute. <clears throat> minute. I, I defer. <laughs> You're done. All right, guys. Well, I think, it's, I think it's a very difficult rule to interpret. You know, when it, what is a legal tip and when, it, when is it illegal? It's a, it also is a very difficult ball to dig. Uh, it, it's very, the power doesn't come from the ball then. It comes from the defender and it's very difficult to, to dig that ball. Also, it tells you something about instead of power to, the, to your spike and it tells the hitters something about quickness to the floor. So uh, we need to look at that. Uh, is a dog barking because of what I'm saying? Is that yeah, that's, you know, I was going for the, that power? The, yeah. uh, the the but I I think it's very it's very difficult to defend, very difficult for the rest ref to call. I wouldn't, but I wouldn't outlaw it. I just it, it's uh, you have to have a real two minutes. Tool. Two minutes. Okay. Well, I think the the issue is uh, right now the rule is anything goes. I mean, Mick shared with me a, a you know video. I wish we had it to, to, to put up where the setter literally grabbed the ball with two hands and threw it to the floor in an international match, highest level match. Was and, not called. And was it not was not called. called. All right, and and he did it. It, it was a beautiful play. All right. But we're going to get kids to start playing jungle volleyball. We're, I mean, anybody's going to look at the game and say, "I could play that game." Uh, I remember being with the U.S. World University Games, coaching that team, and we played Japan, and Japan brought it out, and this was in the mid-'80s, and we could not figure out how to defend it. I couldn't get the girls to get over the net to block the ball because they were always waiting for the attacker to touch the ball first. Well, the attacker would take the ball, grab it, and throw it, all right, and we could never block the ball in time all right, because they changed direction on it. We tried to play defense against it, and it happened too quick to be able to defend the ball. So it'll, it'll end up okay, ruining the game. Up. Okay, item four, deep dish, mangling the ball, and setter doubles. <laughs> all, all in three minutes. <laughs> you got one minute. Well, deep, I'll just continue on the deep dish. I mean, you know, the old beach set. I mean, I, I literally have seen this in the men's game much more than I see it in the women's game. One, because of the size of their hands and because they're, they're masters at copying what anybody else that they perceive to be better than them is doing. And what's happening is they're literally catching the ball and throwing it and changing direction when they do it. And it's not being called. And it's, I mean, again, it's, it gets back into, are we just going to play jungle volleyball? Uh, and and there's, there's not a lot of technique involved in just grabbing the ball, catching it and throwing it. Well, it's, it's difficult for people to understand the game when you can mangle the first ball. I mean, ma mangling is, is when you're either grabbing the, the serve and I mean grabbing it and throwing it up there, mangling it up there. They, they give you a free ball and you can still mangle that because it's the first ball. But then they call a double hit on a set that maybe has a forward spin, but not side spin. Um, a lot of people want to take the officials out of the game and not have those calls because uh, the theory is that if you don't handle the ball with skill, uh, you're not as accurate. And if you're not as accurate, you penalize yourself, but with double hits or mangling the ball. 
um, that would take away from coaches throwing their hands up on the sidelines or running out to the three meter line to, to wait, to see if they win the rally or not to protest and, and all of those things. Those, those are, those are situations that everybody's going to have to make a decision on here pretty soon, because it looks like they're going to, uh, the end result, meaning the kill, not what leads up to the kill skill to the kill. They two minutes. Kill. Okay. Two minutes. I, I really think that it's uh, all sports face the problem of what to call and how to call and how to define what is legal and not legal. It's just very disappointing to me to see the skill go away from the game. Uh, you know, I use the example that uh, when we started in volleyball and people would watch it, they would really be impressed looking at it and saying, what is this game? I mean, what? what's going on and it's a thing of beauty to manipulate a ball that cannot be stopped and you don't have a bat or a racket you have to just use your body to manipulate over there hitting it and, and it's amazing game because of that i i always use the example that uh you know the guys in the bar watch a real game of volleyball and think wow that's amazing now they watch a game of volleyball and think they can play it they think they can just go out there and start playing because you can do anything with the ball. And it kind of looks like that. And so it takes okay, away from the game. That's it. Okay, item five, substitutions and numbers of substitutions. Well, I'll speak on that because I, I think, uh, you know, in the women's game, you have 15 substitutions. In the men's game, which is international rules, you have six substitutions. Um, the women's game stops an awful lot for substitutions. Uh, the men's game does not stop that often for substitutions. It goes a little faster, but you don't have as much strategy from the coaching standpoint because you, you can't sub a little bit more. Um, that's one thing about the substitution rule that we have to discuss. I, I, would, I would propose and have proposed, and I think John Cook is right there with me, that we feel eight to maybe 10 substitutions for both the men's and women's game would be appropriate uh, all around the world instead of six. Um, it, would, uh, it would allow a little bit more specialization, maybe a little bit higher level. Uh, it, it would be interesting. The other thing One is- One minute. Minute. Brian? Uh, substitutions, I think um, it, one of the challenges for our game is we have about 18 seconds of dead time for every four seconds of um, action. So any more delays is, is difficult. The men's game is even worse than that because of the number of missed serves. So they, you have such a, you like in, in basketball, the game, and something can happen at any point. It's almost reverse. There's, a, there's action almost every second. So it's difficult. I like uh, substitutions. I think we have to get to the point that there's no delay in them. Um, and now you have a libero and you have all these subs. And I, I just, you know, I think we just have to speed up because any more delay in a game that has so much stop time anyway is a, is a potential problem for our viewers. One minute. Well, you know, in substitutions, you know, the women's game, it, it's, it's so different. I mean, having 15 substitutions it allows for you know a specialization to the nth degree, all right, and and that's really good for the for the weaker programs because you, you can get specialized players and be able to still be competitive, and then switching now over to the men's game and all of a sudden only having six substitutions, it I, I felt like I'm out of I'm, I mean, there was not a whole lot for me to do. I had my my two timeouts and you know a couple of substitutions. Other than that, you just you sit there and hope for the best. So if you, you know if you don't have top level players, you're not going to be able to compete uh, because you don't have those big all around players. And, and where the, the well, that's, number of that's the problem, huh? Yeah, it is a problem. Yeah. Well, yeah. you didn't make many yeah. coaching errors, Bob. You didn't. Uh... Well, that's true. That's true. But at least I'd like to have some control of what's going well, on. What? All right, that's it. Right. Okay, item six: different rules across levels. Well, I mean, we're just finishing up on this, the substitutions, it's the different rules. Why don't we just get one set of rules for all, all the teams? Uh, you know, it, it would better it would be better prepare players to play the international game. And I realize that's a, 
small portion of the players. So, so maybe it has to be a middle of the road, you know, like a compromise, like Mick was talking about, all right, for all the men's, women's, junior play until they make the move to, to international, but it be closer to the international game if you don't think we can change the international game. You know, the, the, they went to the Libro because that allowed specialization for the, for the teams that, that didn't have, you know, six, nine, you know, people in their, in their country. All right. Uh, but right now, the, the number of substitutions and, and just the difference in rules from one, one group to another makes it real difficult even for the officials to, to be consistent. One minute. No, I'm going to jump in on the rules because I'm going I'm to – why is it that the men – can chase all over the stadium for an errant ball and bring it back and keep it in play. But, but we have some kind of limitation on the women because we're afraid they're going to hurt themselves that they can't run around the court and bring a ball back. Uh, those are the kinds of changes in rules that I don't understand. Uh, and, and are you saying uh, by making these rules that, that women uh, can't play safely and, and do those kinds of things? I, I, would, I would challenge that. Uh, a lot. I also think um, that in some cases it would behoove because of the size of the players, it would behoove the men to have a different uh, backcourt line instead of a three meter line, maybe a, a, a four meter line or a five meter line instead of a three meter line because of the, the uh, ability that they, they have to jump and two minutes, two minutes. Way, way beyond that line. So think about that. I think that uh, um, rules should not be the same. The rules should be completely different. I was upset as a coach that so many rules came down for men's international volleyball. And they were, uh, came, they were first there and then went into collegiate and even into high school. High school girls have nothing to do with the needs necessarily of what the international men need. Each group, college women, college men, uh, club girls, uh, high school girls or boys, uh, international men and women. I think the name, the game, it needs to have rules that benefits that game and benefits the players from that game. And there never should be anything that's universal unless it was good for everybody. So referees can adjust, all can adjust, but we make rules according to how the sport develops for those okay, that's people. It. I think that's a pandemic okay. thing. We're okay, trying to item seven, <laughs> bench protocol. We're on to the next one, bench protocol. Bench protocol, Mick, come on, God. It's our last one for this first 30 minutes. Well, I'll jump on bench protocol. So I, I think uh, I think we've eliminated spectators from the game because we have so many people on each bench standing up that nobody in the first six rows can see. So you can't even sell the first six rows because they can't see. You got the coach standing down at the corner, not moving. You got somebody with a big board charting all six rotations, and I'm I'm not sure what they're doing. Then you've got a blocking coach up next to the three meter line telling the blockers what the next play looks like in the last six rotations. Then you've got all your players lined up along the back line and the sidelines. I mean, if, if, I'm, uh, if I'm trying to promote our game, uh, I'm eliminating the first six rows uh, for spectators and I'm selling uh, the higher cost seats at eight, nine, 10, and 11 so they can see over all these people. Uh, I've never seen anything like this. One minute. One minute, good job. Well, that, that gets into uh, you know, kind of a concern I have with the game right now, especially for the for the bench players. And it, it, the show is that the six players are out there playing the game. That's the show. That's what you're watching. But right now we're we're getting to watching, you know, every assistant coach and how important they are on the sideline. You know, we're, we're watching, you know, the the bench players that aren't good enough to get on the court, see how good they can dance, you know, how, how much they can heckle the other team. Uh, it, almost to the point where it's getting unsportsmanlike. I think that stuff's, it's got to be the game is what we're, we're there to watch. And that's what, where the focus should be. It shouldn't be on all these other things that are going around. Just like it shouldn't be on the referees. We don't need referees. The best referees are the guys, I, I don't even know they were there. All right. And the game was over and I shook the hands and forgot that they were even up on the stand. They said that about coaches too. The yeah, best well, I'm coaches. sure, I'm sure they, they do. Two so minutes. Said before okay, two minutes. Wish. I right. wish those referees were not there. Not that they, you didn't notice them. <laughs> um, 
uh, protocol, I, I, you know, the, what Mick said about the, you know, the head coach has to decide everyone, all the assistance responsibility and not be a distraction. As far as the way players are acting out of the game now is a, it's becoming ridiculous. I watch it. It's all like Bob said, I said, the dance moves, who's got the best dance moves and everybody's fooling around and, and all that. And, but I noticed that when the game gets on the line, there's no more dancing. Uh, and maybe they need to be a little more focused throughout the match and not necessarily only at the end of the match. I think that the antics are comical, but they're distracting and they certainly aren't focused on what's going on the next play. If they go into the game, what they're going to, what, what they're looking for and, and are they getting ready? And my answer is no way. Okay, that's it. All right, that ends our first half of the show. We will handle items eight and nine for the second half. However, Mick, you got a chance to talk about next week's guest. Oh, well, next week's guest. So uh, we decided we'd have our say on some of these rules and fads uh, to start with, but we're bringing in the real, the real culprits, getting them all in one room uh, <laughs> next week. We've got Joan Powell coming in. Uh, from the Pac-12, we've got Ann Pufal, who heads up the, the officials for the whole country. And we'll try to get one, one other official to join us. We'll have three people and, and we're gonna give them the platform to have their position on this. Uh, th you never hear what the officials think. Um, we try not to listen to what the officials think uh, <laughs> as coaches, but uh, the officials have some pretty good things to say and some pretty good ideas. And it'd be, it'd be nice for us to question them and, and see what they've, uh, what they've uh, got to say about uh, a lot of these rules. All right. Excellent. All right. Let's go. Book your master coaches, custom in-person or virtual clinic today by heading over to our Instagram. Click on our bio and click on the master coaches clinic link. If you ever wanted a fantastic one-day clinic near Abilene, Texas, join us June 5th by registering at abilenysa.org. That is Abilene Youth Sports Authority. If you would like to be on our guest list for the Buzz Reaction After Show, please click on the link in our Instagram, want to be a guest, and you will not only receive our updates, your name will be on our guest appearance list. Our weekly Buzz shows are on YouTube, so head over to our Instagram account. Follow us on Facebook, Volleyball Master Coaches, Instagram and Twitter, VB Master Coaches. A special shout out to our partners, SNA Sports and Bodden Sports. And thanks to our content providers, NFHS, JVA, Coaches Insider, and AVCA. Stay on Facebook Live after John closes our show today and join our Master Coaches as we continue our game with rules, trends, and fads. Now, let's go to our Buzz and Buzz Reaction digital partner, Dr. John Foreman, who will update us on his most recent interviews. Can I call myself the Buzz Master today after all this buzzing? Yeah. This electronic whistle? Yes. You, you were great, John. <laughs> that was great. Hey, more you to come. Buzzing more to today, come. John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's good because I don't know what's going on with, with my other content because I'm just trying to get through this week and graduation and start my vacation on Monday. So... Not that that stops anything, as any college coach will know. Recruiting never ends. But anyway, we've got two more topics, so let's let's do some more buzzing. All right, let's go. For those joining us for Buzz Reaction for the first time, today we are continuing our conversation with rules, trends, and fads, and our master coaches have been given a three-minute time limit on their thoughts or on their opinions. So let's continue with our final list. John, let the games begin. Okay, here we go. Coach's box, standing or walking? Wow. Well, I, we I think started addressing that, right, Mick? Yeah, I think you can do anything you want as long as you stand and stay in the box. It's the biggest problem with coaching box is people don't stay in it. It's like basketball. They walk all the way to the midcourt, even though the line's there, and they just kind of see if the referee is going to challenge them or not. It's like a little game they play over there. So it's a second game besides the, the one that you came to watch. Uh, that's interesting. 
Um, the coach's box, I think, is uh, five feet away from the court and from the three meter line to the end of the court. There is good reason uh, as coach, as a coach, to go down to the end of the court. You like to see what your blockers are doing as if you were in the end zone. You can't get that view from the sideline. And if you're having trouble stopping people, a longer view can give you some real uh, interesting uh, ways to change some things if you if you can see what's happening. So I like the movement. I, I like the coaches to be able to get up when they want. One to. minute. One minute. Perfect. Well, I think I think you're right, Mick. For, for those purposes, I think it is good to be able to get up and, and move around, you know, and manage your bench and and get different perspective on the game. The the thing that bothers me a little bit is is when you have a coach go all the way up to the second referee, have have a you know. A, a 30 second, 45 second, you know, conversation of, uh, you know, about whatever, all right, uh, which just basically slows the game down and gives, gives the team another timeout and changes momentum. And, and they should not be allowed to do that if there is a, you know, an area that was supposed to be restricted to. Yeah, I really admire a referee who pushes, tells person, I'm not talking to you, you know, and, and waves to the first referee to go. And to, it would extinguish that behavior you're talking about, Bob. I think it's, it's really is, we don't need to slow it down anymore. Um, I, I, want, I want the schools to all paint that box, paint that box now in the, uh, in the, uh, in the basketball court. You know, I wanted to paint the, the volleyball box lines. I thought that would be pretty funny. You know, but uh, yeah, I don't like, uh, you, you know, sometimes you get closer to the court than you realize, but quickly you see it and, and, and move back. Respect, respect the rules and, and don't take advantage of them. You know, the that rules were ahead of time. Well, I was just going to say the reason that the officials don't do that is they don't want any bad marks on the evaluations. They, they don't, they don't want you to be mad at them because they didn't listen to what you were saying. Uh, that's why they've tried to, to be more cooperative, but they've actually slowed the game down by doing such. And right. so there's got to be a, a hard and fast uh, something that, that takes that, uh, that problem away because the, the officials really uh, get ranked now just like everybody right. else. And okay, last and final. Delay tactics. <laughs> Well, you could start with the uh, number of uh, challenges. There's, there's one way that uh, there's been a lot of delays. You also could, could uh, talk about just what Brian was talking about, conversations that uh, are unnecessary with the down official. My biggest one though, my biggest one is we have a challenge. The, the, they take seven minutes or so to go through this and they finally make a decision and then the coach that lost gets to have another minute and a half or two minute discussion with the down official. I mean, <laughs> I either saw it and this is the way it is, or I couldn't determine it. So it has to stay the way it was called. I mean, what else can you talk about where you're going to go for dinner afterwards or, or what your favorite ice cream is? I haven't figured any of that out. I don't, I don't know what that discuss is it. Are you sure you One want minute. To, you know, I'm, I think, I think, and to that point, Mick, if we had another official, not, not that I'm trying to add more officials to the game, but if we're going to use a challenge and to keep the game moving, maybe we need to look at having a, you know, a instant replay or, or, you know, a review official. And once that official makes the decision, all right, the decision's final. All right. Either they, they can't make a determination that makes it different. Or, and, and so the, the first referee's call stands, or hey, I saw something different, we're changing the call, and we move forward. Would, would you say a delay tactic would be if, if you saw something during a rally that went back and forth 15 times, so you decided to challenge just because they're going to watch the whole rally? That would take almost seven to 10 minutes. Oh, yeah, that, that, that would definitely de delay the game and change momentum of the game immediately. Two minutes. Uh, again, anything we can do to make this our game move is is important. It uh, again, we have too much downtime, too much stoppage for the amount of action. So because of that, we have to keep things moving. I don't like 
well, the idea of sub substitute calling a sub and then waiting for the sub to come in. I mean, there's a we have to move it move it along. Um, uh, we, if we don't, it we're not going to develop spectators to our game. That's why we have all those guys there the bench come diving out onto the court every time there's a big kill. You've yeah. seen that one, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So anything we can do, I just let's not delay it. Keep the game over. Even the referees, the pace of the referees needs to be consistent and, and keep it moving. So Mick, you would think you would say some of these antics on the bench delay hey, the game. Time is up. All right. Now we have a bonus session here. We have four minutes that you can talk about anything of any of the things we've already discussed that you didn't get a chance to say. Four minutes, John. Uh, one thing right away. I think Ruth is enjoying this, cutting us off entirely too much. So we're going to have to have a rule for that. I mean, she, she's really into this. I mean, my goodness. Bob, you're going to delay things. It's a delay tactic by you. I don't know. <laughs> well, I have to say, when we were talking about uh, people along the sideline and the bench, that I have learned some new dance moves from watching some of this. And uh, I think it's relative to the music they play. If you don't, if you don't want the players in the women's game to be dancing, then don't play the most popular music because they don't, they don't know the old songs. If you play something from the seventies or eighties, they're, they're not going to, they're not going to be dancing over there. They're going to say, what is that? I haven't heard that. Um, I went into the doctor's office the other day and uh, a dentist's office and they're getting ready to, to do something to me. And I noticed the music all matches the years that I was in high school. And I, well, I walked out and said, who, who uh, does the music? And they said, well, the doctor orders certain music clips for each patient. So <laughs> they're looking at your age and they're playing the music. I knew the words to every song being played the whole time I was in that dentist chair. So I, I had Mickey and Sylvia, I had everybody. I had a great time. Well, I have a I have a kind of a pet peeve right now, and uh, if you allow me, I I'm watching other sports like uh, uh, you know CBS gave a billion dollars to do the NCAA championships, and when they gave that money, they created their own industry. They created all the terms they use, and and then like the Final Four and so on and so on, and then they uh, you then the like the ESPNs. They have to support that because they support it. It allows them to grow. So it, it's a circular effect. And volleyball doesn't have that. So how are we going to cut into that market? And the only answer is, is that we have to do it through, the social, through social media. And we need to start sharing more. Uh, we have an opportunity right now to grab that huge social media market. Uh, to develop volleyball. The, everybody involved needs to be, needs to share more of the content that they see on volleyball. And if they do, we could get some following that gets the numbers up there, gets numbers up there that we can start getting sponsorship and more media coverage to be, to be included. But the only option in my mind is to get the social media up. And we, and players, coaches, referees, every parents, they have such a following that if we ever could put that together, I think we'd have quite a voice and in, in, in some strength. Maybe we could go with a voice meter uh, on some of these calls instead of uh, instead of looking at uh, replay, we could just do a voice meter. Uh, there you, oh, there you go. Yeah. See, let's see how loud you can be for, and let's see how loud you can be against. You know, we could yeah. we could do that. That would be a a new innovative way to get the fans involved. And then we could have uh, buttons for everybody who's watching on TV. You hit a button in response uh, to that. And uh, you could override the call by the officials when the, when the people sitting home. I'd like to do that for NFL because I've seen NFL people, they go put their head under that hood. They yeah. come out and they call something that you and I just sit there and watched on slow motion. Didn't mm -hmm. happen. Right? Yeah. They'll call it. So mm -hmm. Maybe Las Vegas is running that. I don't know. I used to, I remember so many years that they would put bows in girls, the women's hair 
when they played volleyball, like a bow when you're three years old. And I always thought you should get a double point if you hit one of those bows that went flying up in the air. So okay, maybe okay, I haven't said anything yet. <laughs> wait, wait, we to do that. Banikowski right, used to take this bows over. All the UCLA kids there. Banikowski had bows and all the UCLA yeah. kids there. We just yeah. kind of knocked there still are, There's the fewer time. now, but I think <laughs> my daughter took her bow off at uh, two years old. So... Okay, here we go, guys. That's the end of that. That was a bonus session for you guys. All right, uh -oh. now let's, uh -oh. let's, go to, let's go to master coaches to get their thoughts on jump serving and also address the number of serves that are being missed, especially at the collegiate men's level. Well, I, I have a couple of suggestions to throw out for everybody. So men's tennis is particularly boring when they're missing their serves all the time or it's just aces all the time. Those two things are, are a problem. Uh, but the miss serves in men's volleyball in the United States, and, and Bob can react to this as a men's coach right now, but, but is horrendous. Uh, there's some something around 30 to 40 miss serves in a lot of matches. I'm wondering if, uh, if you uh, could get people to really start concentrating if you gave two points for every miss serve after so many serves missed, like let's say Ruth, your team has five serving errors on the sixth one, cost you two points, not just one point. Well, I'm going to be extra special to make sure I don't lose that extra point. Well, sure, sure. It only confused the spectators, but and the scorekeepers. But other than that, it would be it would be a good uh, message to the servers to concentrate. Internationally, they don't seem to have that problem with miss serves because they seem to concentrate better and they hit the ball as hard, if not harder. So tell me what's up with that. Let me jump in before you, I, I, we're always trying again, this came from men's international volleyball. So they made a rule, let the ball, a let serve happen. And I thought, well, okay, you know, it's not gonna stop the men's games missing so many serves, let it happen. And then I found it to be the stupidest rule of all time because you, you can hit the, sir, you know, when I was young, you'd hit a ball and it would hit the net and fall over on the opponent's side and you go, oh God, that's a terrible serve. Now everybody cheers because you got an ace and one, it, you can't block it. It's illegal to block. And so you're rewarding a mistake. You get a point for a mistake and you can't, how do you defend that ball? How, maybe once in a while, a setter runs into it and the setter gets the first ball up running to the net. But basically a mistake is rewarded for the person who made a mistake. Great rule, unbelievably bad rule, uh, trying to make up for, trying to rule, make a rule for something that's terrible about the game. All right, that's my pet peeve there. Uh, well, that, that, that might, yeah, that might actually help eliminate some of the, the missed serves because they're going to be a little bit more conscious of making sure they get it over the net. And, and anytime you have to add some control, some element of control, uh, you know, it, it requires you to, it, you're going to miss less serves if you're controlling it better. But the, you know, the amount of missed serves in the men's game at, at the college level is, is really causing a problem. Oh, that's a referee. Oh, that's a referee oh. calling you, telling that's you right. think how wrong you are. <laughs> yeah, you're being voted against right now. How about making their server land behind the end line? Yeah, and how about my that thing about my miss service? Why doesn't it? If you hit let serve and it, why doesn't it have to follow beyond the three meter line, which has plenty of time? Why does it? Why are you giving it? Why aren't you lose a point if it falls right over the net? And gotcha. then it's playable beyond the three meter line. That's I, that was a good suggestion. I kind of like that too. I, I like that better than landing. My first good suggestion and rules. <laughs> well, but but Brian, you're right about about the fact that anything that's that's slowing the game down or bore, making the game boring is going to make it less agreeable for people to watch and and the men's game right now and i've talked with john Sparrow about this you know a couple of times and he, he said to me bob nobody's losing games because of missed serves because they're, they're siding out in most cases at, at a high enough percentage that they make up for the missed serves you know and 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 i think there's some truth to that but it's also making the game 
a really ugly game. Yeah. Well, Bob, I listen to these people saying, these guys have always told me, and I watched some ends games that, uh, oh, we're, that group is signing out at 78% in these rotations. Well, if you miss five of your 10 serves, they're already signing out at 50%. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, those are inflated numbers. I, I, I'm not buying it. Well, I, why don't you raise the height of the net for men? Well, well why, don't you, why don't you raise the, the basketball go higher for yeah. Oh, you're, you, oh, we're going to compare it to basketball. They yeah, already well, make I mean, a smaller ball for the women. So should we make a smaller ball in volleyball for women than men? Then they'd be hitting bullets. More, <laughs> twice as many concussions. I thought it was smaller, Ruth. I didn't know. <laughs> I thought it was lighter. <laughs> lighter. There you go. Hey, but, but, but you should come back and say, yeah, but the six people in the stands don't care when you make that many serving errors. If you want... 2,000 or 7,000 people in the stands reduce the error so it's more fun to watch. Have more rallies. Figure out uh, maybe we got to go back to having four blockers, you know? Okay, I'm going to make a rebuttal on uh, Bob. This is supposed to be about you guys, but all you have to do is add one more slot in the men's poll. If you need to raise the height of basketball, it costs money, so it wouldn't cost any more. Well, so I need to get I need to get a drilling company so everybody yes. can bring their Seno poles in or their SNA poles in and That's we, can, we can drill holes for them. There you go. I don't know, you know, ch change. I've always disliked changing the game. Um, um, I think you, you got to be very careful when you start, you know, raising baskets and raising nets and ra changing the three meter line. I watched sports for a long time and in the sport adjust, the sport always adjusts right now in major league baseball, nobody can hit a ball. Watch, watch the play, the hitters will adjust and the game will swing back for a while in our sport. The servers were so far ahead of the passers. And then the passers got ahead of the servers and, you know, blockers were great. And now hitters get by the block. I mean, okay. it, I, I hate to cut you off, but we are out of time for this because June 4th and 5th master coaches, summer coaches clinic will be at Abilene youth sports authority. Could y'all tell us a little about each aspect of the clinic? I want to start. I, I think it's going to be a great clinic. I think the, I think if people haven't heard the four of us and the topics we're going to go over and the detail they can get and how logical it will be and easy to follow and in keys and ideas that they can teach any level and from beginners to the most advanced players that are they that they coach they can use they will use this information and there's something special about being in person uh, away from just the internet information where they're actually there can ask questions can actually see uh, changes being made i i think it i think it'll be a very very good clinic i'm really looking forward to it I think people should come and see Brian how we needle Ruth when she's trying to present. Yeah, this is nothing. We, We're this really is, good this at it. We can we can yeah. really get under her skin quite yeah. well. Yeah, well, three guys against one woman. She's still oh, yeah. up. We're just up. She's brutal. still ahead of us, though. We're, this is better than big time wrestling. I mean, you, <laughs> there's you know, one thing that John and I have. We have the mute button. <laughs> No, we're not doing virtual. That's why Brian's <laughs> this is live. This, this is, is live, yeah. Person here. There's no mute button. <laughs> that's what we like about it. Well, I, I think one of the things that's going to be really good about this clinic is, is we're doing all our championship skill series stuff that we've done before, but now we're adding in the that how that progresses into you know systems and and, and team functions. And, I, and I'm excited about you know seeing how we, we progress the whole thing and, and working with the people about that. Well, there's a good article that's out, uh, was on the internet this week done by Jim Stone. Uh, and, and you probably should read it about learning theory, but he hits it right on the head. And uh, you've heard, you heard the people that say, well, if you're not playing six on six, you can't learn anything. And you've heard all of these, the various uh, ways that people teach. But we're actually using this learning theory that Jim has, has put out so well in his article uh, when we teach our skills for the most part. And, and it's uh, pretty, 
pretty systematic and, and it starts from the basic and works to the law six on six. And so it's re really worth seeing and, and it's worth reading that, uh, that article on the internet also. Well, you know, it's interesting, Sabrina, who is coordinating the event in Abilene with her college experience and also Kellen, who was on last week, was a former co collegiate coach. They both talked when we talked to them about what would you like to see in the clinic, the things they both immediate without even thinking, we need to know how to teach the skills. And I thought that was very interesting, not coming from a club coach, but coming from former collegiate coaches who have coached for over 15 years each at their respective universities said, we need to learn how to teach the skill, not to see the skill, but how to teach the skill. And I think that that's one of the best things that we'll, they'll get a chance to see. I get a kick out of uh, uh, not talking about individual development and then building that development from one player to you know, uh, coordinating players and coordinating skills. I love the idea that's out there now, just you know, six on six and play. Play the game, you'll learn the game. Well, play the game, you might get worse. But then does that mean that you only play golf? You, there's no more driving ranges and no more swing coaches and no more putting greens and none of that. You just go play. Oh, my God, what happened? You know, I can just go play golf and I'll learn how. I don't have to do any of this other stuff. Okay, I got, I'm in. I'm in. You know, if, if we applied that that kind of knowledge, uh, that thought that you could only do it by playing the game, how would you teach football linemen the footwork and the hand oh, yeah. and how how would you, how would the basketball players work on their footwork and reverse pivots and all of those kinds of things? I mean, it's ridiculous to think. And baseball is even worse. They break it down to they only will swing when the ball's on half of the plate, their half of the plate, whatever half that is that they've determined is the best. They they break it down even more than we are ever thought of breaking it down. So if we don't if we don't get back to teaching these skills right and getting kids a chance to who are even good athletes, getting them a chance to reach their potential, uh, a lot of kids don't ever reach their potential because they go to places that people just use their athleticism and they plateau and they're good, but they never get become great. And uh, that's where we're hoping to help coaches become better at that and and get the uh, get the real highest level out of each youngster that they can possibly have. So uh, I think attending a clinic like this is uh, is an absolute must. I'm going to give you an example at an undergraduate school, Winston Hill, which some of you may remember. I don't think Brian or Bob will. He was with the New York Jets. He, he was at school with me and he says, oh, Ruth, I can play tennis against you. And I said, no problem. You want to you teach you a few strokes? He says, no, that's OK. And I said, I need a whole bucket of balls. And he says, why is that? And I said, because I'm going to end up having to chase every ball you hit over the fence. Well, he says, you know what? I can do it. I can hit it in the court. Well, he never hit one ball out of the whole bucket in the court. They all went over the fence. And he says, can you now teach me how to hit a forehand so it stays in the court? So no matter how good an athlete you are, you still need to learn the basic progressions for every skill that you're going to do. Ruth, you remember when... Uh when uh, Flo and Debbie and Rita and all that used to go around playing guys and they played men volleyball players. They didn't play you guys. Off men's the net. Yeah. They at, well, on women's net. Some women's net. They, they, played. Played, on women's they net. played on a women's net yeah. and they would beat them every time. In They'd Pasadena, we used a men's net. Oh, well, yeah, that, we was, that was when women wore skirts. I don't know what no. that no. <laughs> oh, that. Oh, you've done two things today that deserve a mute. Seriously. We're, the other rest of us are much too young to remember that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I lost to Rick's College from Rexburg, Idaho in the National Junior College Championship. And that whole team was wearing skirts. There's no <laughs> question about that. <laughs> they beat you. They beat you anyway. That's right. Yeah. We yeah, didn't wear skirts except in field hockey. And they still there you do. Go. They still do. Yeah. Yes, they still they do. Uh, and they're exactly uh, that. Well, well Brian, your, your point, I guess, was when, when Reader and, and, and the girls had beaten the guys, it was because their technique was that much better than, than the men's players they were playing against. Now, the skill level, you're absolutely right. The skill level was the key. And they could, you know, the block for the men was huge, but they could get by that block. 
and the men had real trouble passing those serves, you know, they were at a women's net when I watched. Yeah. But it was, it was defense was better. Every part of the game was better. Setting was better. And it, but, you know, I'm not saying they were the best men, but they were good men players. Yeah. Hey, listen, we played the national team and my team was made up of arrows Mavericks and my setter opposite me, we were running a four, two was Calvin Murphy. <laughs> and Robert Reed was the pin hitter and Flo is blocking. And Robert said to me, he says, can I just do a 360 and hit? And I said, yeah, but you're going to get the ball back twice as fast in your face. <laughs> he said, oh, no, I'm not. And I said, OK, Calvin, set him a ball because Calvin set in high school. And he yeah. says, Ruth, no, I don't want to set him that. That's going to be embarrassing to us. I said, set him. He set him. He did his 360, turned around, hit it ball came right smack back in his face and he turned around and he says i think i'll take a set off the net <laughs> <laughs> but well, again I uh, what bob it. said is that we're we're you know after 160 years of coaching between all of us and and a lot of success we either were really lucky which i think most of the time i was but we had something to say and we learned enough all of us to we, we knew the importance of really teaching the game and uh, being able to have the skills um, that are better than your competition. And we, we'll do everything we can to pass those on to the people at the clinic. All right, guys, well, our time is up and thanks for joining us today for our extended buzz reaction. We'd like to thank those viewers that submitted their rules, trends and fads for today's discussion. And don't forget to join us next week to hear the rules experts give us their interpretations and what they see in the future of volleyball. For those viewers that wanna be on our Buzz Reaction guest list, jump over to our VB Master Coaches Instagram, go to the bio and click on sign up to be on the guest list. For those coaches that are interested in our consulting services, please email from our link on our VB Master Coaches. Be sure to tell your friends about our weekly news show. And thanks for joining us today and see you next week on The Buzz. And be sure to sign up for the June 4th and 5th Master Coaches Championship Skills Series Clinic by Mick Haley, Bob Bertucci, Brian Gimalero. And do that by going to www.abilenyasa.com dot org.